Good afternoon, family. It's great to be together, and it's great um, to be together online, too. You will, guys will see this later, because we're not doing this live anymore. So, lots of songs about being a child of God and no longer slaves. Could this be a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Not with you. <laughs> um, today, we're going to talk about claiming your inheritance. I don't know, do you, have you ever dreamt about maybe there's a secret aunt or uncle or some lost long love relative yeah. who put you in their, in their will and you're going to get all this cash and your troubles are going to be over, your retirement is going to be taken care of. I am really echoey. Should I turn it off? That's, that's just the mind I've tried to the game and everything. Okay, that's bizarre. I'm going to turn it off. And, oh. Definitely am not turning it off. Okay, I will just talk loudly, and I hope you guys can hear it. Otherwise, be here next week. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, if you know, claiming your inheritance, we've dreamt about it. Sometimes when I can't sleep at night, it's one of those, huh, what would I do with X amount of dollars, right? How many dollars is enough dollars, of course? You know what Howard Hughes, Howard, Howard Hughes who was the richest man, said, right? How much money is enough? Not enough. Just a little bit more. Doesn't matter how much you get, you always want a little bit more. So it's not about the money. But when we think inheritance, we tend to think money, right? So today we're going to talk about what our inheritance actually is. And we've sang about it, so that's a clue. But we're going to start, before we jump into um, chapter 4 of Galatians, we're going to go back to uh, eight, uh, chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Because we need to set the stage for this part of the journey. So remember, he's talking to the Galatians, and the Galatians knew Jesus, but then decided to be real Christians, to be super spiritual Christians, as they had been taught by the Judaizers, who were probably Pharisees. They needed to also be Jewish and at least keep the law of Moses. That's when you were really spiritual. And legalism, which that would be, has an appearance of spiritual maturity, right? Because you might be praying an hour or two hours or three hours a day. You may be reading through your Bible um, in a year. You might, uh, you might be spending tons of time praying for others. You might be doing all these spiritual practices which make you look super spiritual. But it doesn't necessarily mean spiritual maturity. In fact, it's a reversal to spiritual childhood. Because a non-Christian could do all those things. You could not believe in Jesus, so you could still pray. I don't know who you pray to, but you could still go through the act of praying. You could still go through the act of reading the Bible, but it wouldn't make you more holy or closer to God or more like Jesus. And yet we like it because legalism also allows us to measure our progress. It measure results, right? A sense of accomplishment. Oh, I've done it. I mean, how many of us don't like the idea of checking off, I've spent time with God, checking off, I've read the Bible, checking off, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay on my devotional. And though there's nothing wrong with the checking off, unless it becomes about the checking off, right? It's okay to check it off as long as you've actually spent time with God and not just gone through the motion so you can check this off your list. Because that's legalism and that's what Paul is vehemently opposing for the Galatians. Not because it's wrong to keep the law, but because they're missing out on the real thing. They had it and they lost it. So we're going back, Galatians 3, uh, 26. For you all, you are all sons of God. And this is y'all, everyone. For you, all Galatians, all of you there who believe in Jesus, are, are all sons of God. And through faith in Christ Jesus. That's how you get there, through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized, for all of you who were, right, into Christ have put on Christ. So the baptism was take off the old and, and put on Jesus. There, and then he goes on, there is now neither Jew nor Greek. There's no separation between us because of culture, because of language, because of, of race. None of that exists in Jesus. There's neither slave nor free. Your status in this world does not change your position in Jesus. There's neither male nor female. Your gender does not change your position in Jesus. And so we can say that we're all sons of God. It's not anti-female 
It is because we are all the same entity before Jesus. And in that time, what Paul is talking about, the standing, the status, belong to sons, not daughters. So it's nothing to feel like, oh, you know, the Bible is, is uh, not inclusive. Of course it is. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We're one entity, one person. We're all the same before Jesus. And if you are Christ, it says, then you're Abraham's seed. You are a descendant of Abraham if you believe. You didn't, don't have to have Jewish blood thrown, flew, flown through your veins. You have to believe in Jesus and then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs, according to the promise, you're heirs. God promised Abraham that he was his God. And Abraham was his son. And through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. And that spiritual promise belongs to us. We belong to God when we belong to Jesus. So that's how we get in here. So what is our inheritance? How do we claim it? So we're starting off in chapter 4. Now, I say that the heir, so you have an inheritance. Something great is awaiting you. I, and he says, now that I say that the heir, that as long as he is a child, and the word is uh, uh, nepios, and it is a, t a baby or a small child. A little kid does not differ from, at all from a slave, though he is the master of all. But he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So when you might inherit millions of dollars, but if you're a kid, that makes absolutely no difference. You might as well be the slave because you're not getting any of it. <laughs> Some of us who establish wills, especially for young men, sorry young men in this group, um, parents tend to put an age on it, like 30, because until then maybe all that money would be spent on cars and, and having fun in life instead of something wise, like buying a house. And, and so it isn't all that different today. And a wealthy Roman child actually had a, a guardian that was a slave in the household. Remember last time we talked about that they had tutors that were slaves, that were uh, well-learned slaves who brought the child to school and from school and protected it during the day. And so they also had guardians that were slaves taking care of the kid. And so in effect, even though you have all the inheritance maybe from the estate, you have no right to it when you're a little person. But it's under guardians, and the guardians are of the person, and stewards, which is the guardian of the estate or the inheritance, until the time appointed by the father, the set time in the will. And so Paul connects this, this common situation in the culture to how it is to be under the law, having been under the law. So even so, just like that, he says, when we were children, as in under the law, and he's using the same word, so when we were little kids, we're, and we were under, uh, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. And the elements there is the basic principles. We're basically under the ABCs. We were just in kindergarten or preschool. Now, that was the law. It was just a bunch of rules, basics that you needed to live by. And they had been in that for 15 centuries. The Jewish people had been living under the law for 15 centuries. 1,500 years is a long time. So, can you imagine being in kindergarten for 1,500 years? That's a long, long kindergarten time. So, that's how it was when we were under the law. It was like we were in kindergarten. But when the fullness of time had come, when God decided this was the perfect time for Jesus to come, and really, culture had to be ready. People had to be ready. They had to be hungering and thirsty for, for God. They had to be sick of their own solutions. There also had to be certain ways where when Jesus came, they all spoke the same language throughout the region because of the Romans and the Greeks. There were roads that allowed for things to go everywhere and spread from Jerusalem. So it wasn't like he came to the Jewish people but nobody else spoke Hebrew. Then what kind of Jesus would that have been? But God sent him in the fullness of time where the common language was actually Greek. And so they could speak that language everywhere they went. I mean, God knew exactly what he was doing. So in that perfect time that God had chosen, 
long before, God sent forth his son. It really says his own son. He sent forth his son that was natural son to him, not an adopted son, a natural son to him, born of a woman, fully human, therefore. Anyone born of a woman, a woman is a human being. But he was born under the law. God, Jesus, God sent forth Jesus, his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And it's interesting if you think about it, Jesus the only one ever to keep all 613 laws perfectly from birth to death every single day. Because he was born under the law and completed the law, he had the right to die and set us free from the law. So God fulfilled all his own requirements in this process. But why did he send forth his son? To redeem those who were under the law. And redeem means to buy back as a slave. You know, in this time, a, Rome, a Roman citizen, a man, could buy a slave in any Roman city. They were all over the place. And at the time, there were something like six million slaves. Slavery is not a new thing. And, and Paul is definitely not commenting on, their, whether, uh, on whether it's right or wrong to have slaves. But this is the reality that they knew. So the word redeem, they would know. It is buying a slave. You know, to set free by paying a price. So setting that, because the owner had a right to set the slave free or to keep him as a slave. And so redeeming was to buy that person back from the owners in order to set them free. So they would know. It's a weird word for us because we just don't have that concept. But that's what that means. So God sent his son to redeem, to set free by paying a price, those under the law. Now last chapter we also learned that God sent his son to become the curse because the, the curse is, you know, the law. We're living under a curse. And so Jesus became the curse to redeem us. That was one way to looking at this. This was to set us free, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And it really means to be placed into the family as an adult child. Uh, to place, yeah, as adult children in a family with the full rights and privilege of a son. And we've talked about this before. You couldn't unadopt a child. And so once you were placed as an adult child, in that family, that was for keeps. And that's the analogy Paul is using, that Jesus came as a human being under the law to buy us back from the law who holds us as slaves, and we might receive adoption as sons. Now you're not placed in God's family through adoption, you're placed in God's family through birth. So it's really both that happen at the same time. And we, we are born into God's family by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. By saying yes to Jesus, we are born again. But then we are simultaneously placed into his family. We're children of God by faith in Christ, born into the family. That's our condition once you accept Jesus. But growth is still needed. So if you've accepted Jesus today, then you're a baby in the Lord. And it takes time and practice and intentionality and learning from others and reading the Bible and praying. You don't do it to, to look holy or spiritual, but you're doing it to become more like Jesus, to learn more about what this life's all about. But every child of God, that same moment that you accept Jesus, every child of God is placed into the family as an adult son. So those same things are true simultaneously with all the rights and privileges. So the baby in the Lord who still needs to grow in their knowledge and relationship with Jesus is simultaneously an adult child and that position is once for all. And that is great good news for us. Adoption is one of the privileges and blessings that is in our inheritance. We're adopted into God's family. We're no longer slaves. We are in God's family when we've said yes to Jesus. Jesus came to set us free. He purchased us not to make us slaves again, 
but to make us sons, adult children. And so what the Galatians were doing is they, they were, had gone back to living as servants instead of living as sons. And this is why Paul is giving us this analogy. So, we're sons and heirs. And because you are sons, he says, because your standing is as an adult child in the family, whether you're this old in the Lord or you're this old in the Lord, right? It doesn't matter. You are, have the standing as adult sons in God's family. And therefore, and because God, you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. God sent his son to die. And then his son sent a spirit for us to live. God sent his son to die so that we could live. And, the, and Jesus, the son, sent a spirit in us to help us live. And that is the spirit who is the one causing us to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is dad in Aramaic. Father, it occurs multiple times, three times actually, where it says Abba, Father. Father is the word in Greek. It's like they're saying Abba, which is a foreign language, and then Father, that is our language, right? So Abba, Papa, you know. And, and commentators make a point to say Abba is not like daddy, like a little kid going to daddy. Because we're not little kids in God's family. We have the adult, standing of an adult son, and so it's saying dad. But as a child, to a father who loves us. Now, oftentimes, in our own lives, we have had fathers who may have not been perfect. Well, for sure they haven't been perfect, but maybe they were just plain old awful. And so it's confusing. This can be very confusing because it's so hard to imagine a good, loving father who doesn't mean you harm, only means good toward you, who, who gives you the rights and privileges and this amazing inheritance. But this is the truth of our relationship with God. Abba, Father. Jesus prays this in Mark 14, 36, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Abba, Father. You know, if this cup can pass from me, then make it so. But not my will, but yours be done. But he redresses his dad as Abba, Father. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, 15 and 16, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are sons of God. In that same sense, adult children adopted in the family. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We are not slaves to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I have made it a practice since I really started understanding this Abba part to call Father God Abba when I pray to him. And it helps me remember, because my tendency with how I grew up and, and the view of God is that God, you know, is an awesome God, and he is an awesome God, but far, far away. And that distance doesn't help when I'm trying to cry out to him. But when I think of him as my Abba, which separates it from my earthly father, who was a pretty amazing guy, and actually modeled unconditional love quite well, but he, he's not my earthly father, he's my Abba. And when I pray that way, I'm reminded that I can come to him and say, Oh, I can't figure it out. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, but is this too hard? Oh, I, I, I need to hear from you. It is different because I remember he's my Abba. He's my dad. He's a great and awesome God, no doubt. But he's also Abba. Because we got placed into his family. And we have nothing to fear because his entire attitude to us is one of love and goodness. He can't not be because that is who he is. He, even if we don't deserve it and we don't, it's not about that. It's he cannot violate his own character. So if we understand that, then we obey our Abba Father not because we have to, not because some bunch of laws, but because we love him and we know we're loved. And the more we understand how much we're loved, the more we love him and John 14, 15 says, 
if you love me, you obey my commandments. It's not, well, if you love me, you obey my commandments. It's not that, you know, well, clearly, you know. It's not, not this test of, of, of do you love me, but more when you love God, how can you not? How can you not? Anybody you love, you don't just purposely, willfully do the opposite of what matters to them. So this section concludes, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. A more accurate translation may be an heir in God. <coughs> Second Peter 1 4 tells us that we have, as adopted children, the same nature as our Father in heaven, that we are partakers of the divine nature through God's promises. How crazy is that? We're still fully human, but we also live on a different plane and we have. God's divine nature because His Spirit lives in us and we are being transformed. We already live in this in eternity when we know Jesus. So what is our inheritance? Well, the riches that God is giving you today, if you know Jesus, is the riches of grace, His glory, His presence, His goodness, His wisdom, peace, love. It's all available to us. All of God is available to us. That's the real inheritance. Stuff you don't get to take with you. As others have said, you're, there's no U-Haul behind a hearse, right? <laughs> you're not getting to take any of the stuff. So stuff doesn't matter. But who you are becoming and how you are maturing and your embracing that you are a son in God's family if you are a believer and then growing into the maturity of that. That is the ultimate inheritance because then you get to be like Jesus. And you get to be a little bit more each day as you grow and mature in him. So with that, I want to challenge us. How are you living? If you are a son, but you're living as a slave, I just have one word for you. Well, two. Stop it. <laughs> because what are we doing? Jesus didn't buy us back so that we could go back to the old ways and be trapped again. This community, our community, we know about relapses. Yes? Yes. <laughs> We've all relapsed in our various challenges. So don't relapse into slavery. Stay a son, and if you mess up, which we will all do because we're still fully human, unfortunately, right? Then run to your Abba. Say, Abba, I'm sorry. It's gone. Because Jesus already paid for it. We don't have to carry the weight of guilt or shame, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done. It just doesn't matter. But if you don't know this Jesus yet, if you have not said yes to Jesus, or if you've wandered way far off and you need to come back to Jesus, I just invite you to think about this. Don't miss out on this amazing family and this amazing family inheritance. Just like any family, we can be difficult to be around. But it doesn't make us any less the family of God. And it makes our, doesn't make our father not a good, good father. And so it takes a few steps. One is to admit you're a sinner to ask for forgiveness, whether you've wandered off or whether you've never said yes to Jesus. Believe that Jesus came to pay for all your sins and redeem you back from slavery and darkness and death into the kingdom of his Father. And then invite him, because he won't force anyone. Invite him into your heart and life to be your Lord and Savior forever. If that's you and you want to say yes today, and I pray you don't wait. If you haven't said yes, do it now. Or if you've wandered off, come back now. So we don't know when Jesus is coming back and it's too late then. So let's pray. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I ask you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you came to buy me back from slavery and from death and wickedness and sin. 
and that you paid the price, that you became the curse, that you died to pay for all my sins so that I could live, that I could be adopted into your family forever. And I invite you to come into my heart and life to start a relationship with me, to be my Savior and Lord. Will you help me to live that out and to become more like you, Jesus? And Lord, for those of us who've wandered off or for the rest of us who've already said yes, will you help us to live as sons and claim our inheritance and do that every day and not fall in the trap of slavery? We do not have to be afraid. We do not have to, to go back to the old ways and worry about you being mad at us. We just need to commit to loving you and then becoming like you make us more like Jesus every day. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So don't live like a slave. Because God sent his son.